During this season of stewardship, I'm grateful to Nancy for the opportunity to share some of my spiritual journey and the very crucial role that Old South has played in it. Uh, when I was a couple of years out of college, I found myself living under a tree in Rishikesh, India, a, hilgrim, a Hindu pilgrim site on the Ganges with a holy man and his followers. He was a mendicant monk, one of thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, who wandered the byways of India. He satisfied my image of a Hindu monk, always on the verge of some kind of sublime laughter. He didn't speak any English, but was always happy to have a Westerner sitting at his feet. He taught me a, ma a mantra that I still remember to this day, Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Nadine. I gave him some money, perhaps not much for me, perhaps a lot for him. Like so many wandering monks, he depended on donations, on the care of others. People would drop by and give him a few rupees or some bread or, or a mango in exchange for a prayer. It was understood that was what you did. He proudly wore a leather jacket that some other Western seeker had given him. I left after three days. It was time to move on. It was also uncomfortable sleeping under a tree. I grew up in a semi-observant Reformed Jewish family in a town of about 30,000 in the Hudson Valley of New York. We, re we went to religious services on holidays and to Seder at my grandparents on Passover. My father fasted on Yom Kippur and gave money to the temple, although he always felt guilty and a little resentful that he wasn't able to give as much as the more successful businessmen and professionals in town. I went to Sunday school where we learned Bible stories and some Jewish ethics, and Hebrew school where we learned the basics of the language. I was bar mitzvahed and received a gift of a trip to Israel, which seemed to make little impression on me at the time, although I did get to shake the hand of David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel. The, is the Israel trip aside, it was a typical secular Jewish upbringing of the 1950s. There were some other aspects to my growing up. In grammar school, we recited the Pledge of Allegiance every morning and somewhat uh, surprisingly recited the Lord's Prayer, which we learned by heart as well. It became ingrained in me, but it also intrigued me too. What 10-year-old wouldn't be intrigued by words like kingdom and trespasses, even temptation? At that time, or when I was actually a little younger, we had a babysitter named Mrs. Swift, a former Christian missionary in Africa. She read me Bible stories, mostly about Joseph and Moses and King David, never about Jesus, but she gave me a Bible that contained both the Old and New Testaments. More important was my cousin Corinne, who lived in the Southern California desert. She and her husband, both Jewish, converted to Catholicism, a great source of mystery and curiosity in her family back east, uh, especially me. She wrote my mother letters every few weeks, which my mother would read aloud to me, and she would send me books, ranging from a picture book on Jewish history to Dante's The Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy was her favorite book, she wrote me, but I'll admit it was challenging and the many circles of hell confused me. Even though she lived far away, she remained a large and intriguing presence in my life and also an early role model that a Jew could become a Christian and not be rejected by her family, in this case, my family. As a child, I was extremely curious fascinated by politics and history and geography and other cultures. My dream was to travel the world. 
So after I graduated college, as I said, I had the good fortune to spend a year backpacking through Europe and North Africa overland to India, which one could do in those days with very little money. During those travels, I found myself spending a lot of time in churches. I especially loved the Byzantine churches of Greece with their sense of peace and beauty of design and the mosaics. And I also admired the elegance and the gracefulness of the beautiful mosques of Iran and Turkey. I spent time in traditional societies where religion and spirituality were alive in ways that they weren't or didn't seem to be in the West. The reading in my backpack included Dostoevsky and Hermann Hesse and the imitation of Christ. Something was happening to me extremely intense. I was being swept up in something greater than myself, something I had never experienced back in Temple Emanuel in Kingston, New York, or anywhere else for that matter. I could feel the presence of God everywhere. I began to realize that these travels reflected not just the fulfillment of a, of a childhood dream, but also the realization of a spiritual quest. And so I found myself sitting under that tree on the banks of the Ganges, reciting Om Namah Shiva and thinking for a few blissful days at least that I had perhaps found something that I was looking for. Eventually, it was time to return home. I weighed 110 pounds and had a tapeworm somewhere in my system, a companion from my travels. No one seemed to understand what I had experienced. I didn't quite understand it myself. I was emaciated, but still hungry for spiritual fulfillment. So I decided to explore a, a more familiar uh, spiritual tradition, Judaism. I applied to study Jewish philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Maybe that could recreate some of that spiritual feeling, some of that closeness to God that I had in, within my own faith that I had felt on those buses and trains through India and Pakistan. The classes were all in Hebrew, but admissions officers assured me that after a summer of intense language instruction, I would do fine in class. However, being able to stumble through a Hebrew, a Hebrew version of what time does the train leave for Tel Aviv did little to prepare me for classes on Talmudic scholarship. I lasted a few weeks and wound up teaching English at an Israeli high school. I loved the, timing, the timeless beauty of the hills surrounding Jerusalem, but the Judaism of Israel was too orthodox and unappealing, and the Christian tourist sites were just that, tourist sites. One day, wandering through the old city, I saw the sunset from the Mount of Olives, walked through the Garden of Gethsemane, and down the Via Dolorosa. Somewhere in the middle of it, I realized that I was walking along the way of the cross. Perhaps suddenly self-conscious, I took a wrong turn and wound up in the middle of a gaudy bazaar surrounded by merchants selling religious trinkets. It was symbolic. Something wasn't working right. I wasn't able, I was unable to recapture the intense spirituality that I had experienced during my more distant travels. God seemed elsewhere. When I returned to the States in Boston, I was consumed by other interests, working in the early gay rights movement, developing my career as a journalist and later as a teacher, and writing books on LGBT life and history, among other subjects. I was able to come out that need for an authentic self was very much a part of my spiritual journey as well. I never lost my faith in God, yet something remained unsettled. I thought that I could believe and do what I considered to be the Lord's work 
without the benefit of spiritual practice or a religious community. I felt that my writing was doing some good for the world and that was enough. I was giving something in my own way. My contribution to others ended there. In retrospect, that was a naive, even arrogant idea, which essentially took me nowhere. There, there were some moments when the sun seemed to peek through. While in Arizona working on a novel, I wandered into, a beautiful, into the beautiful Spanish mission called San Javier del Bac on the outskirts of Tucson. It was early morning and I was one of the few people in the church. Across from the pew where I was sitting was a mural of the Last Supper on one of the walls of the nave. I looked up and saw the sunlight illuminate the figure of Jesus for a minute or so. It moved on to the face of a disciple and then faded from the mural altogether. What felt quite personal to me was just the sun's movement through the clustery window, a trick of light, perhaps deliberately designed to create that effect by the church's Franciscan architects. I tried to dismiss the experience and gave it over to one of my characters in the novel, a Jewish girl who was considering becoming a Christian, much like my cousin Corinne. It was perhaps a way of distancing myself, but the effect lingered. In Boston, my husband Paul had been engaging in his own spiritual journey as well. Moving beyond his Catholic upbringing, practicing Buddhist meditation, and attending Quaker meeting. So, so when Paul began attending Old South and reporting that it was not only a serious and challenging and welcoming uh, place of worship, I wondered if it might fill a void in me as well. I began accompanying him to church. It was difficult and strange at first, even though I could still recite the Lord's Prayer perfectly, thanks to my grammar school training. The more I attended Old South, I came to appreciate the intellectual richness of the sermons, the social activism of the congregation, the warmth and welcome that I received here. Each week, I began to feel the door of a larger understanding start to open. I particularly enjoyed participating in Thursday night Bible study, first under Anthony, and then Catherine, and now Sean, methodically making our way at a snail's pace through the books of the Hebrew scriptures like Samuel, Kings, and now Chronicles. The Old Testament and Jewish history became alive for me at Old South in a way they hadn't since Mrs. Swift read me stories about King David when I was a child. Old South has proved an unexpected but highly satisfying place to learn about my Jewish religious heritage. It seems ironic to me that a Christian woman and a Christian church were responsible for my education in the faith of my fathers and mothers. And nonetheless, I felt like I wasn't as involved as much as I might have liked in the life of the church. I was getting so much out of Old South, from Sunday morning worship, to Bible study, to community hour programs on Reinhold Niebuhr and Howard Thurman, to some of the best jazz you can hear in Boston, thanks to Willie and Zoe at jazz services. I began reading the New Testament more closely and more deeply. I was particularly moved by the Sermon of the, on the Mount, probably the wide, wisest philosophy ever expressed, and it aligned with my own beliefs. Reading the Beatitudes, I felt that only a divine being could express such sentiments. But as a non-member, I felt I wasn't able to give anything back, wasn't really able to give anything back, I should say, outside of a weekly drop in the collection basket. I was taking and barely giving. 
When I mentioned this to Anthony, he said, Neil, have you ever considered contribute, contributing to the church financially on a monthly basis? Of course, that made sense. Establishing a monthly pledge gave me a feeling of inclusion, even when I was not officially a member of the church. I felt that I was part of things. It gave me a feeling that I was home. And it felt, and I felt even better knowing that my monthly donation was going to important causes as well. Causes like the outdoor worship of Common Cathedral, the homeless pro program of City Mission, the consortium of, church, uh, the consortium of churches that provided sanctuary to a Guala Guatemalan man trying to avoid deportation. I also went to, it, it also went to smaller expenses like new robes and sheet music for the choir and even coffee and muffins at community hour. Stewardship, as has been pointed out, is not just the giving of treasure but it is also the giving of time and talent. For me, becoming a member of the Climate Change Task Force has been another form of stewardship. As a writer, I've been able to use my talents and my experience in my role as the leader of the Climate Change Communications Working Group. In addition to what I, I am doing now, what else will I be called to do? After years of hearing whispers, I began to hear a louder voice. On November 14th, 2019, I was baptized at jazz service at Old South. I became a member on December 5th. These were momentous and memorable occasions in my life. I believe that stewardship helped me on my journey. Now, I'd be foolish to contend that my baptism and membership at Old South end, this, end the story of my spiritual journey. I certainly hope not. By believing in Jesus and his teachings and affirming that commitment through baptism, I feel like I haven't left my Jewish roots behind. After all, the early apostles didn't either. But at Old South, I've found a home after long wandering and a place to enhance my Christian faith and spiritual development. Stewardship has played an important role for me and will continue to do so. As I said, I used to think that contributing to the world meant giving back through my writing, and that was enough. But I have learned that in addition to giving my talent, the giving of time and treasure are equally important. In a larger sense, stewardship is a way of showing gratitude to God for the many good things in my life and for the opportunities that Old South has offered me and continues to offer me. For this year, 2020, I have increased my monthly pledge. I suspect that holy man, perhaps still chanting the same prayer, and sitting under the same tree on the banks of the Ganges would approve highly. Thank you. Amen.